Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to Ubuntu Masters. Um, I'm Chris Coulson. I work um, at Canonical on the security team. I'm joined today by uh, Jesse Michael from Eclipsium and Daniel Kayaka from Oracle. And we're going to talk a little bit about the boot hole vulnerability earlier this year. Um, the session is live and it's being recorded. Um, and I think you get a link to, sent to you afterwards. Um, on your screen, you should see a Q&A box. Feel free to ask questions throughout and we'll try to get to them at the end. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Jesse, who's going to give a bit of an overview of Secure Boot and the uh, initial vulnerability. Okay, th thanks, Chris. So uh, here, here, you should be able to see our slides now. This is the uh, title slide with our uh, title and uh, pretty pictures. But for, for bootloader attacks, uh, we wanted to kind of talk a little bit about the history of why it's important in the first place. So there's there's been this long history of uh, attacks against the boot process. One thing to keep in mind with vulnerabilities in the boot process or other issues there is that uh, in general, things that load earlier have more privilege. So if you if you have code that is able to run and load before the operating system, and is actually responsible for loading the operating system, you have the ability to patch the operating system as it loads. So in many cases, you can disable security controls in the operating system itself. You can insert your own uh, malicious code that runs while the operating system is running. So you have the ability to essentially uh, patch the operating system, install what's called a boot kit, and uh, have your malicious code run while the operating system is running because you have that more privileged position of loading earlier. Uh, and because of that, there have been a lot of attacks against the boot process. There have been boot sector viruses. There are traditional operating system root kits that maybe some code runs in the operating system, tries to hide itself, provide some additional services to other malicious things that are going on in the operating system. But by moving that code into the, the early boot process and while the operating system is loading, that basically gets turned into what's called the boot kit. And you can have your root kit that's hidden as part of the boot process process and patching the operating system as it as it loads. There's some other interesting uh, use cases that have been found against uh, the boot process. There's ransomware against the boot process. Even as late as, uh, uh, so actually, one of the first uh, boot sector viruses I wanted to mention uh, was uh, called Brain. It was from 1986, which is over 30 years ago. So that kind of gives you the idea of just how long uh, this boot process has been been going on, how long these attacks have been going against the boot process. Uh, the Brain virus was, was a pretty interesting one because it was one of the first boot sector viruses. It actually had the author's uh, phone numbers listed in the virus itself. It wasn't a malicious thing, but it kind of gives us the idea of when people started looking at attacks against this process. Uh, much, much earlier, or much, much later, uh, just in 2014, there was uh, the Petya ransomware that also attacked the master boot record. It attacked this legacy boot process, uh, basically encrypted the hard drive, and then you could uh, enter code into the, into the boot volume or boot process in order to decrypt your hard drive. Uh, even later in uh, uh, 2017, there was a variant of Petya called Net Not Petya that it pretended to be ransomware, but it actually was wiping the hard drive as part of an attack that was not intended to be a recoverable, it was intended to be a destructive attack. So it was a, an interesting uh, uh, kind of different use cases for different reasons. So e even though this is a, a 2017 attack only three years ago, this was still attacking the legacy boot process with the master boot record and uh, attacking that legacy process. So one of the problems with the, the legacy boot process is there is no built-in security. There's no signature verification. There, so anyone could modify this and get their code to run. So there have been a lot of additional mitigations put on top of that, like the operating system trying to prevent access to writing to that first boot sector, other things like that endpoint software that looks at the boot sector to see if there's a modification there, uh, other things like that. So because this process has been, been used and active for so long, over 30 years, there were some uh, problems or limitations that were discovered along the way. And uh, there was this movement to transition to a m more modern boot process. Uh, 
Originally, uh, Intel came up with EFI, which was the extensible firmware interface. And they helped build this uh, community or industry organization, uh, the UEFI forum, to create this unified EFI uh, specification. And along the way, as part of that process, uh, this secure boot implementation or design was uh, included in the UEFI 2.0 specification. So it describes how to do this secure boot process and how to do that as a industry standard that will be uh, shared by all these different manufacturers and operating systems. And that included things like uh, key management and uh, signature verification and a design for how this is uh, done securely. So as part of this design, there are uh, several uh, keys that are provisioned into the platform as as essentially the root of trust for secure boot from the BIOS. So these keys, there's the platform key, that's kind of, there's this key hierarchy where the platform key is used to sign the key exchange key and the key exchange keys are used to sign these DB and DBX uh, lists or databases where uh, platform key, key exchange key, DB and DBX are all persistent, non-volatile, uh, keys and key lists that are stored in the, the SPI chip itself. So on your motherboard, there's this external SPI chip that contains the firmware that's used to boot the platform. And within that uh, external SPI chip on the motherboard, there's a, a region that's called uh, the NVRAM region or uh, UEFI variable region. It basically stores this uh, platform configuration including these keys and a lot of other uh, UEFI variables that are used by the boot process. Uh, so that, that is the, the firmware that's, uh, or the, the key configuration in the SPI in your motherboard, that's, that's persistent. So if you replace the hard drive, you still have these uh, keys that are provisioned into the system. Uh, usually your BIOS will have the ability to uh, provision new keys. You can replace the platform key, key exchange key and dbdbx databases with your own personal keys, or if your enterprise is using this for some reason, you can have your own enterprise specific keys rather than using the uh, the, the keys that are originally provisioned by the manufacturer. Uh, as, as part of how this process works, the, the industry has kind of uh, standardized on using the Microsoft as the, uh, the uh, UEFI third party key authority. So uh, Microsoft, their key is generally stored in uh, DB, and uh, that, is, that key is used to then sign bootloaders that will then run, that are provided by the operating system vendor. Uh, in the case of uh, Linux and other uh, uh, open source uh, distributions or dis open source operating systems, uh, there's, there's what's called a shim, where uh, Microsoft for license purposes is not willing to sign Grub or other bootloaders that are distributed under the GPL directly. So they will instead sign a shim, which the shim's entire purpose is to include the vendor certificate and do signature verification of the following bootloader that's loaded. So uh, on disk, there's the, the shim that is signed by Microsoft that's provided by the, the distribution. It includes the, the distribution certificate that is then used to verify uh, the, the bootloader, in this case, Grub, that is also provided by the distribution. And those are both uh, provided by the vendor. Those are on the disk. So when you replace the disk, uh, those are also replaced. So when, when the system is booting up, there's a lot of signature verification checks that are performed using these keys. So here's kind of a, a rough diagram of how some of these different components within the, the UEFI firmware transitioning into the operating system, operating system loaders, kernels, how, how this all kind of fits together. Uh, in some platforms, you'll have a hardware root of trust where there's actual verification of the, the boot block itself, like uh, systems with uh, boot guard and boot guard enabled. Uh, that doesn't always exist. A lot of systems don't have that capability. So uh, essentially the UEFI firmware starts performing signature verifications based on these uh, uh, platform key and key exchange key and DBX that are stored in the SPI firmware. And as part of that trade off or that handoff from the UEFI firmware to the operating system, uh, it, it basically will, the UEFI firmware will, will then verify the shim. Uh, the shim will, will run and verify grub. 
Grub will run and as part of its operation, will load and verify the, the Linux kernel. So there are these uh, signature verifications that are being performed there as well. Uh, so one, one uh, complication is that Grub is verified, but the Grub configuration file is not verified. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. So last year, there were some issues with the Kaspersky rescue disk where uh, the, this is a third party tool. You can get it on a flash drive, boot the system. It is assigned, uh, it does use a signed shim and bootloader. So you can load it on uh, a system that has secure boot enabled. Uh, th this, uh, there was a vulnerability found that you could load this where load this on a system where secure boot is enabled, but you can use it to bypass secure boot and load untrusted code. So uh, this was found last year, I think uh, July or so. Uh, in February of this year, over six months later, uh, Microsoft pushed out a patch to update the D that DBX uh, variable to uh, basically the revocation list. So DBX is essentially the, the deny list of if anything is stored in DBX, don't allow it to load on this system. If anything is stored on DB, allow it to run on the system unless it's also included in DBX. So DBX can be considered essentially the uh, the revocation list. So if there are any problems with previous things that were signed, updates to the revocation list are used to prevent those from being loaded on the system. And uh, Microsoft pushed out a patch for this DBX update through Windows Update in February of this year to update that UEFI DBX variable to block the Kaspersky bootloader from running on any systems that this has been deployed to. And they only pushed out, I think, five new uh, five new entries for the Kaspersky rescue disk, but it caused a bunch of unexpected issues where uh, systems failed to boot. Systems uh, would hang during while the update was uh, being pushed out. And because of these un unexpected issues, they pulled it. They pulled this DBX update from Windows Update in less than a week. So there were a bunch of issues. It worked fine on some systems, but didn't work on other systems. But this got us thinking. It's like maybe we should start looking at other bootloaders. So uh, I, I and another security researcher at our company, Eclipsium, went and started looking at bootloaders, and we started looking at third-party bootloaders, kind of focusing on those because we figured those would be the most likely to have issues and. We uh, did some fuzzing and some experimentation and started getting some crashes, including uh, our overflow, the full string of A's showing up in some uh, registers at the crash point. So we thought this was really promising and did some investigation. And here's the code that we ran into where this is the point where it starts to dereference the, uh, the overflowed state. So at this point, we control all of the contents of that uh, the grub lexer parameter variable the, the lexer parameter. So all of the fields that are under that are things that we control. So uh, these two first two red boxes are highlighting a couple of the uh, conditions or constraints that we have, but the first two would record and recording. We just need to make those not null. And then uh, record pause and len, uh, the stir that, that grub len, stir len stir, that is the, the next token that's being parsed. And as long as we make sure that that will fit in the buffer that is uh, being described by these record pause and record len fields, we can skip the reallocation and immediately get to this uh, uh, stir copy that is using two values that we control added together as the, the address to copy the string that we also control. So this is what's known as a, it's a write what where primitive. So it's an arbitrary, we can write any value to any address. and there, there's some interesting complications in the uh, UEFI environment because operating systems, things have uh, progressed quite a bit. And there's things like address, address randomization, the stack is no longer executable. All of these uh, mitigations have been put in place to uh, protect against this type of uh, exploit and make it harder to turn these into a, a full exploit. So. In UEFI and execution environment, we actually don't have address randomization in most systems. There's been a push to uh, to make that more available, but most systems don't actually have address randomization. The stack is fully executable. The heap is fully executable. So having this kind of uh, primitive makes it really easy to turn that into arbitrary code execution. So 
at this point, we basically knew that this was an exploitable bug. We uh, started reaching out to uh, a canonical security team, some other Linux distributions. We had a little bit of trouble finding a secure way to reach out to Daniel because we found the, the Grub mailing list, but I didn't find a, uh, a, a GPG key or specific direct address to uh, reach out with. So uh, uh, Alex Murray at the canon canonical security team helped point us to Daniel, gave us his address, GPG key, and we uh, basically reached out to, to Daniel at that point. At, at, the, at the same time, we were basically trying to find all of the different vulnerable shim and grub samples that we could find so that we knew who was affected to this by this, because we knew that multiple Linux distributions were affected, uh, some different OEMs, different third-party uh, tool vendors were affected. So at that point, it was just, we need to find all the people that were affected and uh, reached out to Daniel and then Daniel was able to take it from there. And I'd like to, uh, at this point, uh, pass this over to Daniel so he can, uh, uh, continue explaining from uh, his perspective. Uh, thank you, thank you, Jesse, for for the introduction to the UFI Secure Boot and initial uh, your initial investigation. Yeah, uh, Jesse and Mickey from the Clipsum uh, uh, sent me an email with uh, initial results of uh, their investigation. Uh, this was encrypted with uh, P PGP, uh, so uh, everything was pro uh, uh, all information about the issue was uh, was pro protected, and we started from 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 that point. Uh, as Jesse said, uh, we were starting in, uh, uh, we started reaching different parties which can be interested in getting information about this this issue. This was quite difficult because sometimes it was uh, difficult to uh, find um, security teams in, in given companies or direct contacts to, to this. But uh, we managed to, to find uh, finally all, all uh, needed contacts. Uh, here I would like to underline uh, the responsible uh, disclosure which was uh, uh, done uh, professionally by Jesse and Mickey from Epsom because uh, this way we were able to provide all the security fixtures in timely manner. We are able to work uh, um, in silence and do not endanger uh, crap and stream users uh, to to uh, um, issues which were not which, which, which were not, not fixed. So this was very important, and I think that all uh, uh, issues, security issues, should be reported in that way. Uh, as I said, initially we used uh, email uh, with PGP to, to do communication. Unfortunately, this uh, uh, kind of communication is not very convenient because uh, um, you have to get uh, the keys from various sources and not uh, always they match exact emails, etc., etc. So this is this is not, not this is not very convenient. So we were so, so we started looking for more direct communication tools and we decided to choose uh, the Keybase. Uh, uh, software which uh, allowed us uh, to do uh, quick communication over secure channel, but also uh, gave us uh, functionality uh, uh, for uh, file sharing and um, uh, and Git. So this was very very convenient and uh, useful tool. Uh, we are able to we are able to share all documentation, uh, all specifications which we were working on, or and also we were able to uh, exchange and discuss uh, the code uh, for Shim and for the Grab um, for uh, for the Keybase. Uh, and um, all, every, all, all communication was um, encrypted and pr protected so this this is a very very nice tool additionally we quite quickly realized that this is not only one issue uh, in, in the grab the issue itself uh, reported by by uh, eclipse was quite easy to fix it was just one one uh, liner but uh, we uh, we started uh, ask uh, uh, we started asking ourselves if, if there are any other problems in, in the grab and we quickly realized that there are more of them. So we set up uh, a weekly, uh, weekly meetings uh, with Eclipse, Microsoft, Oracle, and Red Hat. And this way we'll, we were will, we will able to con uh, control all, all and check uh, that we're on track 
and control all things which were we are doing uh, on a weekly basis this this is this was very important to synchronize this these uh, things additionally we are able to discuss the directly all technical uh, uh, things um the the discussion was especially heated at the beginning of of this of of, of this uh, um, of this work because we had to solve uh, a lot of uh, different te technical uh, things what are, what the things were were are uh, uh, have been uh, so, uh, as I said, uh, initially you know, we discovered one issue, but uh, we started looking closer uh, uh, at the code and we discovered uh, more, more issues uh, like uh, integral uh, overflows, underflow, underflows, use after free and many, many, many more, more in different uh, parts of, of graph code. Uh, the biggest change uh, which we introduced uh, was the uh, uh, was the, uh, the code change for, for safe math, let's say. This was required to cope with uh, these uh, underflows. Uh, this was just a simple header which uh, relies on uh, the functionality uh, which were provided by, uh, by, compiler, by compilers. Compilers just provide uh, basic uh, functions, um, math functions, uh, which uh, returns information about uh, um, uh, overflows uh, in, in math. So this were this way we were able to introduce these functions in in um, vulnerable uh, places and this way we were able to quite quickly uh, check uh, for 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 uh, for the errors and uh, fail safely, uh, safely uh, then crashing uh, then crash graph so this this was uh, very very important uh, because uh, in upstream we decided to rely on 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 the compilers uh, we had to bump the compiler version a bit because uh, earlier compiler, compilers that doesn't have this uh, this uh, functionality. But unfortunately, this uh, created an, an problem for older distributions, which uh, uh, use older compilers with, without uh, math function, with, without safe math functions, and they were forced to uh, take some. Uh, map emulation functions from from other uh, from other sources. Uh, so uh, they had uh, uh, they had to, in this case they had to check uh, and compare the licenses between uh, uh, the grab and and this code which uh, it was usually usually taken from uh, from Linux kernel uh, and this involved some some uh, work with with legal, legal departments departments. Uh, another uh, uh, other issues were discovered by uh, uh, by the coverity. Uh, this provided also some useful information. This way, we are able to find uh, some, some issues in, in, uh, uh, in the code, and uh, we were able to fix um, all uh, all issues, all important issues reported by the, by, by the coverity. So this, this uh, as, you, as, you, as you can see, uh, this work around graph fixing uh, required much more effort than uh, uh, it uh, looked like at the beginning. Uh, this, this, this was huge effort to fix all, all these issues in the graph. Uh, during this work on the graph, we quite quickly realized that also Shim required some changes. Uh, the the problem was that uh, we uh, came to the conclusion that uh, currently uh, uh, some distros use uh, some signing strategies which are not uh, which would not be very flexible in the future. For example, if you would like to, uh, if you find an uh, an security issue in in the grab. Uh, then you have to uh, revoke all signatures for all uh, other app, uh, artifacts like uh, uh, like um, firmware update tool or uh, Linux kernel. This is not very uh, very convenient. Um, so we decided to um, to um, think about various uh, uh, signing strategies which uh, would be much more fle uh, flexible. As I said, we spent uh, a lot of time discussing uh, uh, various approaches. And finally, we were, we were able to propose uh, at least three 
uh, signing um, uh, methods. Uh, we we, uh, we proposed one uh, which was uh, most flexible but uh, uh, very complicated, and uh, the the third which uh, which was uh, uh, the easiest one but uh, 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 least flexible. So so uh, every distro, every grab user, shield user, were able to choose uh, the uh, signing strategy which uh, fit in uh, into the their uh, requirements. So th that that was uh, that was our uh, our goal. Um, and additionally, this required some changes in in, in the shim because uh, in previous shims uh, we had only support for uh, one um, one certific uh, certificate. So and that is why uh, uh, we had to start to, uh, to work uh, on the code which supports uh, multiple certificates in the shim. Uh, all the work uh, had to be done uh, in, in silence because if some uh, we realized that if some uh, something uh, pops up uh, in in the public, then uh, it will uh, some people bad actors may realize that uh, something is happening uh, around the grab uh, and uh, shim uh, and it would uh, let's say endanger our uh, our work. So we decided to do this work in silence. Uh, we used uh, Keybase to um, uh, discuss uh, code changes in the shim, and we also decided to move temporarily the shim review process to the uh, to the Keybase for the same reasons. Uh, so all major distros did a shim review uh, uh, over 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 the Keybase in in this case, and all uh, uh, shim requests were accepted, and uh, uh, finally the shims. Uh, were signed uh, uh, by by Microsoft. Uh, we also added some uh, more requirements to to the shim uh, uh, shim review request uh, because we also discovered some other issues in in in, in the kernel and these uh, requirements had to be put into uh, into the shim uh, request review to to be sure that we do not introduce any security uh, problems from uh, from the kernel. Um, and third um, thing which we had to uh, to update was uh, DBX. As uh, Jesse, sorry, as Jesse said, DBX provides information to the system what uh, uh, binaries or signatures um, found in in the binaries should be rejected. So this means if uh, if a given binary which uh, is uh, uh, is on this list uh, should be uh, should not be uh, loaded and executed by, by UFI. So we had uh, to put uh, information uh, about the shim into this uh, into the DBX. Uh, this uh, created a few problems. First of all, we had to find all all the shims, uh, all artifacts. Uh, which uh, would allow uh, you to load broken cap. So we started uh, uh, checking uh, various databases, various databases, including Microsoft ones, and compare all all, all results which were which were which, which were found um, um, by the um, uh, by this um, uh, uh, for for this uh, for this work. So uh, we found all, all uh, uh, shims uh, for all major distros, and also found uh, uh, shims for other other products, and uh, uh, calculated uh, calculated uh, the hashes of them and provided to the, to the Microsoft. But in, but during the, that work, we quite clearly realized that if we introduce this update immediately to the system, then uh, uh, probably uh, we we. Uh, Prevent loading some, uh, 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 prevent loading some uh, systems which currently are installed on on, on these uh, uh, machines, but also we will prevent running uh, installations media which uh, are currently in in the wild and mm, can be used to restore the system. So this required a lot of discussion how to do that properly because. If you do not uh, DBX update uh, uh, for the bootload issue, your system is not fully protected. So this was uh, this was uh, the problem. So after a long discussion, we decided that we have uh, we will publish the DBX uh, update with all the hashes for the all shims which uh, allows uh, allowed you to to load the grab. 
but we will delay automatic uh, uh, installation in, in, in the system for quite significant time. We discussed it mostly about one year or something like that. So, as you can see, there were, there were a lot of things to do during this, uh, this um, um, boot hole, during, during fixing this uh, boot hole issue. Um, and there, there, are a lot of, uh, there were a lot of parties involved in, 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 in this fixing. Uh, there were 18 companies working on, on, on this issue, uh, mostly Linux distributions, various appliance, uh, appliances vendors, BIOS vendors, UFI uh, security response, in Microsoft, etc. There were also 100 people involved in the process. So this is a huge team, uh, uh, and it required a lot of um, coordination of, uh, among all, 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 this, all these parties. So finally, uh, we, uh, uh, we reported uh, eight, uh, eight CVEs, uh, posted 28 grab fixes, and uh, uh, also Microsoft published uh, a new DBX with 156 new hashes and three new sets uh, uh, in it. So as you can see, this is a huge effort. And here I would like to thank everybody who was uh, involved in, in fixing this issue. And I'm happy that I was able to be a part of, the, of, this, uh, of this thing. Uh, so and, uh, and now I would like to uh, turn over this to uh, Chris, who will be talking about uh, uh, distribution point, point, of, point of view. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Daniel. As, as mentioned previously, we um, we knew quite early on that this was going to require a revocation of all of the existing um, versions of Grub. And these are quite expensive, um, not just with the amount of um, non-volatile storage that these revocations take up, which is limited on, on most devices, but it also requires a lot of extra work. Um, it requires respinning install media, um, and when we start doing things like this, it requires a lot of coordination between teams. Um, normally, when we publish a security update, it's, the, it's, it's done under the umbrella of the security team. But in this case, it requires the involvement of the foundations team and the release team and other people in, inside the company. So we were very keen to try to only go through this process once. Um, so I'm going to give a bit of an overview of, of how we made the most of this um, this period and, and this we're obviously used to handling embargoed security issues but the embargo for this was much longer than usual so the the, the goal of revocation is to prevent um, vulnerable versions of, of grub from running and a, a simple way you could do this would be to revoke all of the vulnerable versions of grub by adding their their hashes to dbx but th this is not very feasible where, with the limited amount of storage um, uh, there, there, are, there are so many versions of Grub out there. So as a, as a compromise, what the, the process normally involves uh, a key rotation. Um, you sign the fixed version of Grub with a new key and you revoke all of the other, or, or, all of, you revoke all of the keys that have signed vulnerable versions of Grub. Now, most, most Linux vendors, um, they embed their, their code signing certificate inside Shim. So, in that case, uh, a key revocation involves rotating that certificate and producing new versions of Shim, and then revoking um, all of the versions of Shim that contain the old certificates or certificate or certificates. Uh, they, they may be more than one. Um, this is a lot more feasible. There are far fewer versions of Shim out there, um, and I, I think Daniel mentioned that on a previous slide that there were 156 new new signatures in the um, most recent DBX update. Um, in this, in, in this um, signing model, the, the firmware is indirectly responsible for preventing vulnerable versions of Grub from running. Um, and it does this by refusing to load versions of Shim that contain the old certificates. Um, but Canonical does this slightly differently. Um, and in fact, I think Debian does as well. We embed a CA certificate inside Shim, and then we have a separate code signing certificate, which is signed by the CA. So in our case, the a key rotation involves signing new versions of Grub with uh, a, a new code signing certificate and revoking the old one. And we can do this without doing a Shim update. 
Um, in, in this case, we, we add the old code signing certificate to DBX. The major difference in this model is that Shim is responsible for preventing vulnerable versions of Grub from running rather than the firmware. Um, and that's quite a significant difference because as far as I'm aware, this functionality hasn't been widely tested um, in Shim in, 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 in production scenarios so far. So we wanted to test um, we, we wanted to test all of the versions of Shim we've previously had signed by Microsoft to make sure that it would actually handle these revocations correctly. And um, so I very early on in the process, I, I set up uh, a virtual machine with a custom um, EFI signature database. And I revoked our uh, current signing key. And I tested all of the versions of Shim that we have previously had signed by Microsoft. And that um, came to tw 12 builds in total, um, dating all the way back to October 2012. And fortunately, all of them work. And although some of the older versions of Shim didn't display any um, useful um, boot failure messages. Another thing we wanted to do, um, going on from uh, from Jesse's comment about the Kaspersky revocation, um, we knew that the DBX update would be quite large, so we wanted to um, we wanted to test this on some of the devices we have, um, personal devices, but also some of the devices in our certification lab. So. I prepared a mock DBX update um, with about 300 signatures in. Yeah, yeah, about about, about 300 signatures. And I, I created a set of instructions for, that people could follow um, to take control of their um, signature database and test these updates. And I, I, I tested them on my, my personal devices and some of my colleagues tested them as well. Um, we ran some tests on, on devices in the CERT lab we didn't ha we didn't hit any issues um no, no we didn't hit any issues that prevented a device from booting um we did find on some devices with older firmware they didn't handle database updates with more than one signature list um they would only apply the first signature list in the update and ignore the rest of them um but this i i think i found this on a very old dell laptop from about maybe five or six years ago one other thing we spent quite a bit of time doing, we, we thought it would be a good idea to do an audit of Grub. Um, the idea being that we we wanted to see if we could find any other issues that other researchers might find um, after the initial disclosure. Um, so we, I started off by um, running Grub through Coverity um, and Coverity is something that security team and Canonical have been using um, recently. Um, as part of the review process we, we go through for reviewing new packages that we're expected to support. But it's not something we use extensively on, on existing software and it's not something that we'd run Grub3 before. Um, so it was, it was quite interesting. It found quite a lot of defects. Um, but when I started triaging these, I found that many of them were outside of the signed um, EFI image. Um, and, and those defects aren't really relevant for secure boot bypasses because you can't load uh, you can't load external grub modules in a secure boot environment. And a lot of them also had no or, or negligible security impact. So I I moved on from um, I moved on from triaging the coverage defects we found and started to move to a manual audit of the code. Now grub's quite a complicated project, um, but there's a few there's a few parts of Grub that I focused on um, specifically. Um, Grub, Grub contains um, file system drivers. It contains image decoders and font decoders for, for the theming. Um, and it has a simple networking stack as well. Uh, and all of these tend to have um, uh, quite a complicated security history. So I thought it would be a good idea to focus on these first. And it turned out to be quite productive because I found a bunch of integer overflow bugs um, in, in various file system drivers. I found one in an image decoder as well and in the font decoding. Um, I, I verified these as well. Uh, I actually created um, specially crafted file systems to test these bugs with to make sure that we could actually hit them um, and confirmed all of them with actual test cases. For, for those of you who aren't familiar with the consequence of an integer overflow, um, say you you have a you have a calculation that overflows and then you use that overflowed result to perform a memory allocation. The result of that is, is you you allocate a buffer that's smaller than you think it is. 
um, and then that results into a buffer overflow bug. Uh, I also found one use after free bug, um, and that was caused by uh, inadequate um, in inadequate protection of uh, global structure. Um, unfortunately, none of these were actually detected by Coverity, um, and I initially wasn't entirely sure why, but um, recently I've realized that actually probably what we need is some Grub-specific Coverity models, um, and that might be something that we uh, want to create in the future. Um, another thing I did as well, I, I reviewed all of the open bug reports we have um, in, in Launchpad for Grub. Um, we we got a lot of bug reports from uh, with with varying amounts of information in them, um, and there's always a chance that somebody has reported a bug that potentially has a security impact that they're not aware of. Um, so I thought it would be a good exercise to go through some of those open bug reports, and it was it, that turned out to be a good idea as well because we found one existing um, secure boot bypass bug um, that was specific to the Ubuntu version of Grub as well. <laughs> I mentioned the integer overflows on the previous slide. Um, I thought I'd pick out one in particular because I find this one quite interesting. Um, and this is this is a, a, I've seen this kind of bug in, in in previous software packages as well. So if you look at the top diagram, um, so you have a, a, a payload that has a size field and some string data, um, and this is this is a typical um, symbolic link on a file system. And the, the size is the inode size, and the, the string data is the actual file contents. Um, when you read that in, you, you allocate a buffer to fit the string data in, and you add an extra byte to fit the null terminator in. Now, assume that assume the size in that payload is actually the maximum size for the storage class. Um, when you add the extra one to fit the null terminator in, it overflows to zero. So you perform a zero size allocation. Now. Zero size allocations are actually implementation defined, and they don't always do what you expect it to do. Um, and certainly in the glibc allocator and in the grub allocator, they do perform a memory allocation um, and will return a pointer to a buffer that you can't use for anything other than freeing. So in this case, you, you perform the zero size allocation, and as soon as you copy the data in from the, from the payload, you've got a heat buffer overflow. And the other things that we did during the process are things that we do um, for every security update. Um, only in this case, it was a lot more complicated. Um, there were a lot of patches for us to backport. Um, I think we backported around 25 um, per release. Um, I don't think we backported every patch um, that went into the upstream Git repository. Um, some of them were for modules that were outside of the that, that were not covered by the secure boot environment. Um, we have to support two different um, upstream versions of Grub um, across four Ubuntu series, um, but it's actually it's actually more than two versions because the um, patch set we carry evolves across those releases, um, so the, the the code base is quite different between everyone. Another difficulty I had when I was working on this is the, the change management has evolved quite significantly across the Ubuntu series as well. Um, older versions of Grub aren't managed at all in version control, and newer versions are managed in Git, but the, then within that we have different patch management systems, and it's all it was all very complicated to track. It was. Um, some, of, some of the patches we backported um, touched a significant amount of code, um, and Daniel touched on one of those. Um, the addition of the overflow safe arithmetic functions touched a significant amount of code and they were um, interesting for us to backport. Obviously with any update, testing is quite important um, and especially so uh, um, in this case where bu bugs in the boot process are very difficult to recover from. We can't just push out another update and have it automatically apply. If your machine doesn't boot after an update, then yeah. <laughs> It's it, it's a manual recovery process. Um, we tested uh, we tested default um, EFI and legacy BIOS configurations. We did the the pre-release versions of Grub we built are built in a private PPA, uh, and those PPAs don't have access to the production signing keys. But, uh, so the the Grub builds we test are signed with a um, PPA specific key which means we have to make use of, um, of mock 
um, in order to test secure boot environments. Um, testing the default configurations isn't sufficient in this case, though, because um, there's a lot of a lot of changes in code that isn't executed in a, in a default configuration. So I looked through every patch that we backported, um, and I pulled out all the ones that touch code that were not covered in the default configuration. Um, and some of those are things that, that touch commands that aren't in the default configuration. Um, they, they use the touch code that is used for non-default file systems um, in the networking stack, which generally isn't used by default, and the theming as well, which it generally isn't used by default. We, we created a test matrix um, with uh, lots of manual test cases in. Um, and I think there were 23 different manual test cases for every Ubuntu series, which is 92 tests in total. Um, and I, I, I mostly worked on that, but I did ask for help from other people as well. But it turned out to be a little bit ambitious. Um, by the time of the actual disclosure, we'd only got through about 47% of those test cases. But we had tested 15 of the 23 test cases in at least one series. Um, we did prioritize, we, we prioritized the test cases that we thought would be most, most widely used. And the testing was quite difficult as well. Um, I, I, I did all my testing in a virtual machine. I did well, multiple virtual machines, but some of them had quite complicated setups. Um, and, and one of them in particular, um, testing with uh, full disk encryption with an encrypted boot partition, which isn't something that we support by default in the installer. Um, unfortunately, despite all of this, I mean, I, I spent just over a week full time going through these tests. Um, by the time we did the release, we still had um, a significant regression um, on legacy BIOS systems. Um, and it was, it was a case that we hadn't thought of um, and wasn't covered by any of our test cases. Um, and the issue was uh, we had an ABI mismatch between the grub core, um, which is stored in the master boot record, and the modules that are installed in the boot partition. Um, and effectively, the bug was caused by um, the, the modules being updated during the update, but grub core on the active MBR not being updated. And there were actually more than one bug here. Um, that the, the, fir the first one was caused by um, broken RAID configurations um, on setups that have multiple master boot records. Um, and it turns out that we actually have documentation telling people how to create um, those broken setups. And the other issue was a historical cloud image bug, um, which had been fixed, but hadn't been corrected properly on existing cloud installations, unfortunately. So I'm gonna I'm gonna kick off then with a question to Daniel. I am. Um, how are you going to improve the Grub development process to avoid these types of issues in the future? Okay. Uh, thank you about this question. This is important. And I started working on that because I, I thought I'd be more picky on during a review process. Some people don't like it. <laughs> but unfortunately, I have to do that. So this is one thing, uh, let's say, working on uh, less sloppy code, asking for more for more checks, uh, which usually uh, are until now were ignored. Uh, so uh, that is why I'm starting for more checks uh, for different parts of code to be sure that uh, that uh, uh, we do not uh, execute, for, for example, as, as you uh, said, Chris, malloc with zero argument, which is un undefined um, behavior. Uh, so uh, that is one thing which I'm working on. Uh, additionally, uh, we would like to introduce more test more testing uh, uh, in the grub. Currently, we are testing all bytes. So we are checking that uh, uh, currently uh, all architectures, uh, architectures and platforms build collectively, but of course I agree that this is not not sufficient. Uh, we have in Grab uh, some mechanism to uh, to do to the checks automatically. This is make check command, but unfortunately it doesn't. Uh, uh, not all uh, tests run correctly. Uh, 
uh, we will be working uh, on fixing these issues uh, shortly. I hope this will provide a very nice um, tool which will, uh, will give us information about uh, uh, all the issues which were found uh, in, in, in the code. Uh, also, we, we would like to um, uh, introduce um, usage of stat static analysis, as, as you said, Chris and I earlier. Uh, we were using uh, we were using the coverage during uh, fixing boot hole issue, uh, but I think that we should start using the coverage and other static anal analyzers uh, to run it on almost every patch which is introduced uh, in grab maybe in batches or something like that but anyway way i think that uh, uh, the coverage and other stuff like analysis should be used on a day to uh, uh, and day by day this is this is uh, very important uh, these are things which i'm going uh, to introduce in, in, into uh, into uh, into the grab oh, of course of course we are, we are we have also some support to trade this uh, tests. Uh, this is initial support, not fully working. But uh, I, I'm also. Uh, I would like to also ask some people to work on on, on these issues. And uh, of course, we uh, we also considering running some fuzzing on the graph. This is very difficult. My my colleagues try to do to do that. They had some successes, but it is very difficult. But we will be working on on that in the future, and, and this is another in, uh, area for improvement. And probably will provide more information about the the state of the code. So this is what I'm going to do in the graph right now. Okay, thanks. You mentioned fuzzing there, actually. So I've got a question for for Jesse. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so you also mentioned um, you started off with um, fuzzing yeah. bootloaders early on. And um, what kind of tools do you use for doing this and um, what processes? So with, with, with Grub, as, as Daniel just mentioned, Grub is kind of a, an interesting case that's a little more difficult. Uh, yeah. in, in this case, we had actually just done some basic manual fuzzing, just taking the configuration file and putting long strings in various different places. Uh, yeah. I, I would like to, uh, like I, I'm familiar with using things like AFL and some other, uh, some other fuzzing tools, uh, Peach. Uh, all, all of those are, there, there's a lot of really useful tools out there. Uh, the difficult thing is there, maybe there's a, a particular parser that handles input that's untrusted or provided from a potential attacker like the grub configuration file mm -hmm. or these file systems you were talking about. If we can pull out that code and like run that, that parser in a separate framework that then we can toss it into AFL yeah. or, some other, or some other fuzzing framework, I think that would be a, uh, pretty uh, useful and give us some good results. Yeah. There are also some other uh, uh, analysis tools that have started to add uh, uh, UEFI uh, framework and capability. I think there's a, I think Keyling framework has started mm -hmm. to add some UEFI support there. And that's built on things like Unicorn Framework, and you can do some building and uh, experimentation with that. Uh, what we had specifically done is using uh, uh, Kimu with uh, the GDB debugger connected to that and able to uh, mm -hmm. kind of experiment and see what's actually happening once we get crashes in, in the system. But yeah. able to do that testing in a, a virtualized or a software emulated environment rather than having to hook it up to a real system and use like Intel hardware debugger and things like that made things uh, quite a bit easier. Yeah. Yeah, I've yeah. been using QMU for a lot of my, my work yeah. as well. Um, so, so what you've described actually is the, the reverse process to how I found bugs. <laughs> so, I, so, so I, so I went, I went actually looking for specific bugs in the code, and then once I found the bugs, I produced the artifacts that actually made Grub crash, which is <laughs> the, the completely backwards, I think. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we we totally started with like yeah. we, we we got some crashes, and let's go yeah. find out where where those are. So that's kind of a different approach. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, I think definitely automating some fuzz, fuzzing and building that into automated smoke tests or uh, regression mm -hmm. tests would be a great idea. Yeah. Yep. This is our so, one. Yeah. So, so Daniel, so Grub at the minute is quite complicated. I think I mentioned um, it, it has its own networking stack and it has image decoding and theming and support for fonts. I think that might surprise quite a few people who probably think that Grub's this thing that, <laughs> that you know, it shim starts up and all, all Grub does is basically load and start the kernel. 
and, yeah. and, and execute some grub commands, but it's actually a lot more complicated than that. It that provides quite that provides quite a lot a larger attack surface. Um, is, is there anything um, planned that might help reduce that attack surface in the future? Yes, I know what what you mean. Um, uh, yeah, I agree that uh, the, the grab code is huge and it is a Swiss uh, a knife, uh, uh, Swiss army knife. So this is this is uh, this is uh, very convenient, but as you said, it, it is huge attack surface. Um, first of all, currently you can use uh, modules uh, to reduce uh, attack surface. So simply you can build an image. Uh, which we are going to sign and uh, just put into this image only modules which uh, uh, which uh, provide support for features which which we are using. This is a thing which can which which we can currently use to reduce attack surface. Of course, this is not uh, this is not full solution for the for that. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about introducing something uh, similar to kconfig, which currently is in many projects like uh, Linux kernel, which this idea comes from Linux kernel, but it is also used currently in Zen, for example. And I think that this is a good idea. But uh, I'm afraid that it requires a lot of work because uh, it, it has to be Put into the grab and integrate it with with the, uh, with the source code. Uh, this, uh, if we have the kconfig uh, or similar solution, then for example, we'll be uh, be able to more precisely choose uh, uh, features during build time and remove also features uh, which currently exist in the grab kernel and we, which we are not able to remove using the modules, for example. Um, the core functionality is uh, one thing which cannot use, and probably there is a lot of things. Uh, 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 if you remove various modules, then probably uh, uh, more and more code in the grab is uh, uh, in grab core is unused. So this is this is very important. If we have a, 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 a kconfig functionality, then I think that we will be able to. Uh, to remove all this, all these pieces from from the graph kernel too. But I think that it requires a lot of work. Uh, but I'm going. To, I'm thinking about taking a stop at, at this, and I hope that at this at some point we'll have uh, this functionality in the graph. I hope this replies your questions. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so someone has actually asked a question. Um, are, are there plans to publish a grub version three? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> there, there are no plans to pub publish uh, version three, probably on in the near future. I think uh, because it will be confusing because because we have uh, currently a version uh, grab two, and will be confusing that we'll be releasing version two, uh, three of uh, grab two. So <laughs> probably we'll stick to version two and we'll be uh, bumping minor minor releases uh, or, or something or something like that. Uh, I, I I may say that uh, I'm going to cut uh, Grab to version 2.06 RC1 by the end of this week. So I I suppose that to some extent this uh, reply uh, uh, your question. It will be <laughs> six divided by two. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's I just hope. a number, really, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It is. It is just uh, just a number. I'm joking, of course. Yeah. Uh, but but uh, after some, we I thought at some point that maybe it, it, it uh, bump. Maybe it makes sense to bump a uh, major version number. But uh, uh, other my tenants uh, told me that this is not a good idea because we can introduce some more more confusion. So probably we will stick with uh, uh, with two for uh, uh, for a stable uh, future. I think. As you said, Chris, this is just a number. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, what can keep the question? Sorry. So we don't have any more questions yet. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay. Bye. Cheers. <laughs> Bye.